ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final episode of the Sonic Advance Retrospective. This time we're reviewing Sonic Advance 3, the final Sonic game to be released for the Game Boy Advance. <laughs> Shut up. So how does this goodbye to the console fare? Well, actually I've heard about everything when it comes to this game. Some say it's one of the worst 2D Sonic games of all time with piss poor level design. Some say it's just meh, middle of the road, and some say it's actually really good. Critically, the game got favorable reviews, for the most part, with critics citing the team mechanic as an innovative new feature, even coming so far as to beat out Metroid Zero Mission in the 2004 Golden Joystick Awards in the Best Handheld Game of the Year category. The game also sold phenomenally, and so did the first two advanced games, and honestly, that actually really surprised me, given the fact that from my research, I can only find like a few commercials from Japan, but in North America? I guess Nintendo Power articles did the trick, seeing as all three advanced games have sold in the millions. As for myself, this is one of the earliest Sonic games I was ever exposed to alongside the Mega Collection Plus and Shadow the Hedgehog, so how does it hold up nowadays? Well, let's find out. Honestly, I don't even know where to start with this game, so how about the options menu? Well, I only say that so I can talk about how there's a Chow on it, and with it, a remix of one of the Chow themes from the adventure games. Anyway, here you can choose several modes to pick, the single player, the multiplayer, the time attack modes, and the options. So let's get the extra modes out of the way first. The time attack mode is once again the same as before, pick any combination in any stage and try to beat your best time in one life. The three best times are the gold, silver, and bronze stars, which carry over to the main game beautifully with, in my opinion, the best ranking system in a Sonic game to date. Sonic games in the past have had extremely bullshit rankings where the slightest mistakes can cost you the entire thing, like getting hit once right at the end, or not having a high enough score, and some of these things may not even be your fault, seeing as the game's design always has to come into question in these moments. The other alternative seems to be getting an A rank or an S rank is piss easy like Shadow the Hedgehog or Sonic Generations where you don't even need to try to win. Sonic has always been marketed around his speed and so this is why Advance 3 does rankings the best. Each stage is a gold, silver, and bronze ranking which are determined by time alone. Take as many hits as you want, kill or don't kill as many enemies as you wish, it doesn't matter because in Route 99 Act 1 you need to get to the end of the stage in a minute and a half, no exceptions. This means you don't have to be a damn perfectionist just to get a good rank. On your first go you won't get a gold star in every Every single stage, in fact I find it highly unlikely, but the more you practice the better you get and the better you get the faster you go, which from my understanding has been the foundation of Sonic since the first game, but I'll expand deeper into that way later in the video. Getting a gold star in every stage allows you to do the time trials for the bosses which is a ton of fun because these bosses are just that, but again more detail to come later. Anyway before the review begins the multiplayer must be brought into question and it's easily the best one yet. There are two ways to play. You and a friend can travel through the campaign as two characters and help each other out to get to the final boss, or you can pick a combination and the other player can do so, meaning that you can race each other with your preferred combos. It's even four player to get everyone in on it. If you for some crazy reason find yourself playing your GBA with friends, I wholeheartedly recommend Sonic Advance 3 since there are so many modes to choose from and a ton of fun to be had. And if you don't like the game, you and a friend can suffer through it as well. Now that all that's been said and done, let us dive into this review of Sonic Advance 3. One of the biggest potholes that I've run into while making this retrospective is the fact that I don't know where to start these videos, which is a reason why they've taken so long, but I guess there's no better place to start than with the game's story. The game begins after Sonic battle with Dr. Eggman getting his hands on one of the seven Chaos Emeralds and with this he manages to split the world into... seven pieces? I'm honestly not sure if it's seven pieces like Sonic Unleashed or if it's seven separate dimensions given the way they get from place to place. Anyway, Sonic and Tails now have to travel across all seven worlds, rescue their friends Knuckles, Amy, and Cream, and stop Dr. Eggman, but along the way Sonic and company have to face off with Gemerald, who is Emerald rebuilt for wrecking havoc. Design-wise, I actually think this is a better look than Metal Sonic himself, however, they never really talk about Gemroll in the story, he just kinda exists, which is what I think is a missed opportunity, seeing as we know the admiration the characters had for Emerald, but I guess it's just the nature of it being a 2D Sonic side-scroller. We do get miniature cutscenes of meeting a new character, and these are always fun to watch, given the fact that they understand the characters and their dynamics really well. However, with that said, I think that covers the story. Following the opening cutscene, Sonic and Tails will find themselves in Route 99, the hub world. 
Yes, this is one of Sonic Advance 3's new features, as well as one of its most controversial, among a long list of other things. I think these hub worlds are a massive improvement over the Advance 2 map system, seeing as it's virtually impossible to get lost, making getting to each level as easy as a snap of a finger. In addition to that, if you're having trouble with one level, you can beat the three stages in any order you wish, so if you can't beat Ocean Base Act 2, try your luck with Act 3. I mean, of course, there was no way you could get lost from stage to stage in the Advance 2 map system, but anyway, the real reason why I say this inclusion of the hub worlds was a great idea are these mini games. Each hub world has two mini games when we play a capsule crack game, and this is my personal preference of the two. It's fairly straightforward and satisfying, seeing as you have to rank up enough points to get the thing open, red giving three points for those who get it quickly, yellow for two, and blue for one. The other one's a bit more open-ended. You have to hunt down every enemy in the area with whichever one you kill filling in the gray circles with green. I have a harder time with this one, seeing as it's hard to see everything all at once, and so sometimes I don't get them all, but even if I do, I usually take a while so I don't get too many lives in the end. Finishing both of these quickly will earn you a maximum of 5 lives, so if you do both in each home world, that's 10 lives per hub and 70 lives total. Once you do it once, you can't go back in, however, upon resetting the game or getting a game over, they open up again. Now let's get into the gameplay. The only characters available at default are Sonic and Tails, and in my humble opinion, they're the best combination, regardless of who the player character and who the partner character is. They basically play the same as they have in the other advanced games, and so the controls and mechanics are the same. The boost mode in Advance 2 is back, but has been supplemented by another mechanic as opposed to the ring system from the last game. That mechanic being that whenever you play as Sonic, or Sonic is the partner to another, you can enter the boost mode when running forward for a bit since you'll be going faster as Sonic or when partnering up with him. When holding down the R button, you can activate the tag action, and there are two for each partner. A pro tip being that Sonic is probably the best player character in the game, and easily the worst partner character. I think the reason is that Sonic was obviously the first playable Sonic character, and so his gameplay was the foundation that Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Cream were based on. They were meant to be like Sonic, with a different spin added, so therefore he can't really add anything to them. Hence why his tag team action is just putting the player character into an instant boost mode. When the shoe's on the other foot, the other characters add a lot to the Sonic's abilities. Like how Tails can help Sonic reach higher places, Knuckles can make him stronger, and how with Cream he can do the homing attack from the 3D series, as well as being able to breathe underwater forever. When partnered with each other, Sonic and Tails and Amy and Cream can do the L button tricks, much to the same effect as Advance 2. However, the difference here being that since Knuckles cannot do it, the game cannot design moments where you have to use it without the player knowing it is even in their arsenal. Even if they did, Oma Chow from Sonic Adventure 2 is back, and by picking him up, he can give the player tips like what the Chow do, where to switch characters, and when to use what formation. So if you really don't know something, he's always a good person to ask. Tails as a partner will allow him to carry you to higher distances, which is fine, but short-lived, so it hardly saves you in a pinch. What's more useful is his ability to send the player flying into the air, which is good for getting up to high ledges without having to wait for elevators. Other than that, when partnered with Sonic, he can do all of his usual moves like spin dashing and flying. So now that's said and done, that begins Route 99. Which, by the way, is it Route 99 or Route 99? I always pronounced it Route 99, seeing as that rolls off the tongue easier for me. But anyway, for the opening level in a Sonic game, I really enjoy the fact that as opposed to a forest or a beach, it begins in a lively city filled with moto bugs and blocks that want your ass. The level design is a lot of fun to traverse through, and unlike Advance 2, multiple pathways are in abundance, which has been the focus of the 2D Sonic level design since the very beginning of the series. Hmm. Maybe that's why that modern Moran jab liked Advance 2. It was linear like his feck in Avenger 2. This zone also has a ton of grind rails to get your feet on, and this shows another improvement. That being you can land on rails from any point as opposed to just the tail end, which makes rails over pits much more balanced than it was in Advance 2. All in all, Route 99 looks great, sounds great, and has fun to traverse level design. What more could I ask? The first boss shows us the template for the bosses in this game will follow often very original concepts that have never been done before in the series. This game has no wrecking balls, no drills, none of the Sonic cliches. Dr. Eggman in the first boss is inside of a giant hammer that swings back and forth and occasionally comes down to hit you. If you do it side by side, then it's pretty predictable, however, if you learn the invincibility frames, you can get two hits in on each side, ending the battle in half the time. Zone 2, Sunset Hill, continues the phenomenal level design from the first zone, only now we have the sunset sky in the background accompanied by one of my favorite Green Hill renditions of all time. I enjoy all the set pieces here, like the giant wall, which can be approached via a few different angles that will be explained in a bit. I love the rushing waterfalls, the parts where you run on the water, grinding on the rails, traveling across the boardwalks, pits that are very manageable to get across with good camera angles, uh, except for this one at the end of Act 2. But Act 3 is amazing for all the things I've already said, but right at the beginning of the stage, there's this giant wall that Sonic Sonic, Tails, Amy, and Cream can't get up, so they have to take the long way around, making the stage clock in in about two and a half minutes. But with Knuckles, he can climb up the wall, which is really a shortcut that makes the stage take about a minute. 
At the end of Act 3, Gemrel appears. He was also in the boss act of Route 99, and the Gemrel fights are pretty easy, all things considered. However, a nice touch is that with each battle, he grows in strength. At the beginning, he runs back and forth, and at the end, he's teleporting around, firing missiles all across the screen, and what have you. One of the biggest issues I have with Sonic Advance 3 rears its ugly head here in Sunset Hill, Toy Kingdom, and Cybertrack. Those levels are where you unlock Knuckles, Amy, and Cream, respectively, but here is the problem. The game encourages you to pick whatever combination you want, but arbitrarily you have to be Sonic in Act 3 of the zones I just mentioned so that the dialogue box triggers, thus unlocking the characters for your party. I just find this to be counterintuitive. Not much to say really, it's just a huge oversight. It would be a cool idea to have different dialogue depending on whatever character you are, but they didn't take that opportunity. So basically, if you play this game, keep this in mind when you get to these levels. I have one problem very akin to this at the end of the game, but more on that at the end. With Knuckles unlocked, the game opens quite a bit. Knuckles obviously adds a bit of strength to the characters, allowing their B attacks to break through walls, with the tag actions for Knuckles being tossing him into walls, as well as gliding on top of him. When Knuckles is the player character, some of his abilities are tampered with, like how when Knuckles is with Sonic, he can't glide, or when Tails is with Knuckles, he can't fly. It's this kind of stuff that makes me think that Sonic is the best player character, since like I said, his powers are always enhanced, whereas some of the other more obscure combos, they just tossed their hands into the air and took away classic abilities. The worst defender coming up when we get to Cream. I say the game kind of opens up now because with this, the formation system comes into play. Nobody ever talks about this, but similar to Sonic Heroes, there's a speed formation, a power formation, and a fly formation. The speed types are really simple. Any combination where Sonic is either the player character or the partner character is a speed type. The traits of the other formations might be there, but speed is given the most emphasis. Like I said, Sonic must be the partner character to allow the other player characters to enter the boost mode. People often complain about the acceleration in Sonic Advance 3, but that's only limited to the speed formation. In addition to that, I love the way the speed formation works, since when it's combined with the partner system, this allows for tricks never possible in previous games. For example, guides say you need Sonic as the partner to get up the wall in Sunset Hill Act 2, but if Sonic is the player character and you build up enough speed and jump at just the right time, you can totally make it. The best example being how in Toy Kingdom I missed this trick ring I was supposed to hit, and so I thought outside the box, and this happened. <laughs> The speed types carry so much momentum that this is possible, and that's something I love about this game. The power type is any combination where Knuckles is the player character or the partner character, but Sonic is neither of those roles. He overrides all combinations, making them a speed type. I like that since he's the main character, but he isn't left out of the power type-like abilities, seeing as he's given the ability to destroy certain blocks with his B attack with Knuckles. And if it wasn't already obvious, then that's what the power type basically allows, breaking things that couldn't be broken with the speed and flight types. The boss of Sunset Hill is limited. Eggman rolls on a ball across the arena, and you have to hit him at just the right angles, however what the boss really needed was widescreen. Then the whole arena could be in the frame, thus making the boss more interesting. Instead, we need to make use of a platform in the middle to balance the battle in our favor. So once again, for the fourth and final time in this retrospective, the aspect ratio of the Game Boy Advance has held us back yet again. Zone 3 is ocean based, and correct me if I'm wrong, seeing as I haven't beaten most of the Game Gear games, but I think this was a new set piece for this series, an underwater laboratory, although technically ocean based seems more like a factory underwater than a lab, but Sonic 06 is the one that had this idea done pretty well, with the lonely atmosphere with the occasional fish going by the window, but this isn't Sonic 06, it's Advance 3. Beyond the curiosity of what this place is, this is easily one of my least favorite zones in the game. Not because of some easily avoidable crushing block that can be seen coming a mile away. Okay, maybe that was a bit hyperbolic. Since many parts of this level do require you to know things ahead of time before progressing. But crusher blocks were never too bothersome for me. All things considered, Ocean Base is not terrible, but it's definitely not good, seeing as Act 1 and 2 drag on for far too long, taking upwards of 5 minutes each, with Act 3 being a fun 1.5 minute to 2 minute stage. Although one thing I noticed in Act 1 was that once upon a time I played this game on an emulator and the level design of Act 1 was altered slightly. In this altered edition, the path to the second Chow in the stage was blocked, so I couldn't seamlessly get all four of them in that stage without backtracking. However, in this mystery realm, I could just collect the key and leave the stage without having to finish the stage first. I know I just sort of dropped in elements of the game I have yet to discuss, but again, I'll talk about them later. Point is that does anyone own this version of the game? Was the game reprinted with these differences? I mean, who knows? My research turned up fruitless on this. So I guess we'll just move on. The boss for this kind of reminds me of the one in Secret Base from Advance 1 only on steroids. Again, it's rather predictable like the first boss, but he does throw a curve in every now and again with the attack to go down to the ground sending a shockwave out. With Knuckles as Sonic's partner, this can be cheesed rather simply, and that's what I like about these bosses. They're very pattern based on like the hit him 8 times approach to classics in Advance 1 and the complete RNG insanity of Advance 2. 
The next zone's Toy Kingdom, or how I view it, music plant, but better. The reason being that this is actually a fun level. Many of the moments require precise timing and the level is filled with multiple pathways as well as amazing opportunities to use the extra abilities presented to you by the partner system. The visuals are just perfect, like how the enemies are toy soldiers, piggy banks that suck up your rings, and instead of springs we have jack-in-the-boxes that are safe when blue and dangerous when red. Balloons to pop, ferris wheels, and the level even has rides to go on which gives this level an identity no other Sonic level can take away from it. I don't like these pace breaking moments with the crushing blocks, and I also don't like the elephant rides that will kill you if you do the L tricks at the end of Act 2, booting you back to the start of the stage since the biggest issue in this zone is by far the lack of checkpoints. Although if this level or any other are really giving you a hard time, again, the mini games are for you. But another improvement over Advance 2 is that we're now going back to the Advance 1 method of saving, which means that you don't have to redo any levels you've already done since the game auto saves once you exit the level. The boss is one of my least favorites in the game though. Eggman's in a giant toy box, and it feels really unpredictable as to when he's going to launch Gemroll, and I'm also not a fan of how long it takes to get him into the opposite side of the pit, which serves to drag the boss out. Also, just as a warning, do not spin dash in this fight. Doing so will cause you to be bounced back into the other side of the pit, meaning you'll have to redo the whole thing. Now with that said, that covers Toy Kingdom. It's at this point where Amy is unlocked, and she's really interesting. If you've been following these reviews, Amy has had two different playstyles across the first two advanced games, and so Advance 3 finds a way to integrate both. When partnered with Knuckles, Tails, and Cream, Amy closely resembles her Advance 1 style, albeit with a bit more speed. She still uses the hammer to great effect in addition to being unable to spin dash and spin jump. I like playing as Amy this way, like the double jump she gets from Tails, as well as the big hammer she gets when partnered with Knuckles. When partnered with Sonic, she plays like how she did in Sonic Advance 2, which makes a ton of sense with the spin jump and a spin dash. When Amy is the partner character, that makes the player character character play like her from Advance 1 with a normal jump, a hammer, however the main trio can still spin dash and spin jump with a double tap of the jump slash attack button. So if you liked Amy's gameplay style but still wanted to use some of the features of the other characters, then that's totally up to you. Now that we have Amy, we're introduced to the flight type, which means that any combination featuring Tails, Amy, or Cream that does not have Sonic and Knuckles in it are the flight types, since again, Sonic overrides everything and when he's not in the combo, Knuckles overrides everything else. Upon looking it up, the flying formation allows for longer travel time in the air, which I guess only applies when playing as Tails or Cream with Amy, and when Tails is the partner character. Also, like I said already, Amy can double jump with Tails, so there's that. But beyond that, the flying formation is the least useful one in the game, since I don't see much of an advantage to using these combos. Anyway, Zone 5 is Twinkle Stone, it reminds me of Ice Mountain from the first game with the canyon setting and going underwater, but this level does add a minecart system throughout the whole stage. This doesn't really add much in the grand scheme of things, Sings is purely for spectacle, however I must compliment the background design here. The northern lights look absolutely phenomenal, easily beating the atmosphere of Ice Paradise from Advance 2, which I already gave a compliment. As for the level design itself, I don't know how I would have enjoyed this level more. This is my favorite zone in the game, with the best set pieces like running on the water, icicles falling, perilous grind rail segments, and say it with me, these levels are wide opened. So much space to explore, so many new things to see every single run of the stage, so many different ways to use the partner system, and these levels are not short, making the gold rank requirements very high. Like I alluded at the beginning, as a result of these rankings, beating these stages in about a minute and a half makes you feel powerful, like you're traveling at light speed, not that fake crap they do in Advance 2 at many of the 3D games. This is real speed built up by you learning the level design and being able to master it by going as fast as possible, which is what Sonic was designed to be ever since 1991. The boss here is probably one of Advance 3's worst as you travel up a vertical shaft having to dodge annoyingly unpredictable attacks, with the threat of instant death hanging over your head the whole time. I recommend getting Tails as a partner or playing as him since you can fly, therefore making the jumps less demanding. Also the invincibility frames are a lie, jump on as many platforms as possible and then that path to victory will be swift. There really wasn't too much to say about it, since in your first playthrough you'll be on this boss for a long time, but the thing is, if you know what you're doing the boss lasts about 32 seconds, so I can't really comment on much. The next level, Cybertrack, is a much improved techno base from Advance 2. For one thing, I find the background in this level much more appealing to the eye with the flat white background with the rainbow static, as well as the platforms appearing and disappearing with each individual pixel flying away. I love the moments of straight running, and I love the bits with these rotating platforms as well, in addition to the grind rails and reverse gravity. I don't like the parts where you have to ride these platforms for an extended period of time, which is a feature in Ocean Base as well. And that is why these two zones are my least favorite. I also don't like the length of these levels, and I don't care for the hub world since I think it's the worst designed hub in the game, since there are so many points of no return where you'd have to go back to the whole hub world again just to get where you want to go. Cream is the final playable character unlocked, and rightfully so, since Cream is just as broken as she was in Advance 2. Although I didn't like her there because it felt like she was used as a crutch early on to make the game not a total slog. Here, it feels like an extra boost to your power right before the finish line. 
You have earned she is the Chow this time, since you had to make it here. And every character can use him now, since Cream as the partner character allows the player character to take control of Chi's temporarily and wreak havoc on bosses. She also provides other benefits, like Sonic's immunity to water, like I mentioned earlier. However, when playing as Cream, it's the same thing as before, only Cheese is stronger with Knuckles as a partner. Although I have one combo to talk about, the absolute worst in the game, Tails and Cream. Here we have the two characters known for their flight, and when these two are partnered up, Neither of them can fly? Tails hovers for a few seconds and Cream hovers with an umbrella. I really don't get this. Why not make like them fly for longer periods of time or with higher velocity or something like that? Taking away the defining features of these two characters is the reason why this is the worst combo in the game. I mean, of course, it's not unplayable, but it's just so baffling because you'd expect something really cool for partnering up Cream and Tails. However, with all our characters unlocked, I can discuss the team names. For some reason, not every combo has a name, but for the ones we do have, there is the unbreakable bond of Sonic and Tails, the fighting buddies for Sonic and Knuckles, the lovely couple of Sonic and Amy, and lastly, Team Jubilee for Amy and Cream. Wait, what does that even mean? Let's see here, a special anniversary of an event, especially one celebrating 25 or 50 years of a reign of activity, no doubt it. In Jewish history, a year of emancipation and restoration celebrating every 50 years, uh, I doubt that one. Also, we have a period of remission from the penal consequences of sin granted by the Roman Catholic Church under certain conditions for a year, usually at intervals of 25 years. Yeah, let's go with that. The boss of Cybertrack is easily one of my favorites. You have to use the physics to bounce these spheres back into Eggman that he's sending across the screen, but you have to time it well so that it'll hit him quickly because if the sphere bounces off the wall too many times, then it will disappear for good. With the pinch mode being him sending them all over the screen. Very creative boss that I always enjoy. With that said and done, we now reach the final zone, Chaos Angel. And man, on my first playthrough, I got my ass royally handed to me here. This level is difficult. It's very perilous with bottomless pits and traps all over with tricky jumps and hazards. However, I think that's the best thing about Chaos Angel. That and the atmosphere. Ah, uh, the atmosphere. With the purple sky in the background, the full moon, and the parts inside the temple with the candle lights and text on the wall, it just feels like we're traveling closer and closer to the center of this incident, because in actuality, this level is the path up to the Master Emerald. Or rather, a corrupted Master Emerald, which is our only chance of putting the world back together. All that's well done, however I do have a few problems. Act 1 and Act 2 of Chaos Angel are far too long. I always beat both stages at the five and a half minute mark and that gets me a gold ranking. 2D songs just just not need to be that long in my opinion. Split Act 1 and a half and there's Act 1 and Act 2 and take the first half of Act 2 and that's Act 3. Problem solved. The real Act 3 is an elevator ride as enemies are coming your way and I'll tell you now, Bring Cream to this affair, since if you're playing as her, then you can easily combat these enemies with Cheese. And if not, bring Cream as the partner character to use Cheese as the tag action. Once you do that, this level becomes a pretty huge cakewalk. If not, then you'll be here for ever with these enemies slowly coming across the screen, but still if you get hit you go flying off the platform and you have to do the whole stage again. I also never really liked this boss battle. It reminds me of the Cosmic Angel boss in Advance 1 but souped up. Here you must travel on both sides of the rope as you hit Gemroll sending Eggman into the spikes. I don't know, it always just felt annoying and unpredictable to me and it drags on for too long. Overall a lacking boss. So that brings us to the final 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 level. Alter Emerald, and I don't know what to say, this level is just a straight line and two bosses, and I love every second of it. The first being the final battle with Gemroll, and this is the hardest one yet with him having evolved to his most powerful incarnation, taking all the different attacks he used throughout the game and merges them all into one boss. Still not hugely difficult, but definitely a fight. But that's when the true final boss arrives. When I was younger, I actually could not beat this boss. These attacks are really powerful, very hard to dodge, and it's so fun! I don't know what to say, I just find the process of learning this boss fight to be fun. I'm given all the necessary information I need to win, but I just need to put it into practice and land those hits in as much as possible. It feels like a final encounter on par with Sonic 3 and Knuckles. There are some attacks I think are annoying like the red spheres and the part where the arm grabs you, but all in all, a great final boss. So now we can get our well-deserved final boss and ending. Ow! Wait. I collected all the emeralds and I got no boss? Well folks, this is another one of the game's worst flaws. You have to play Alter Emerald twice to see the ending. Here's why. When beating it the first time, regardless of whether or not you got the 7 Chaos Emeralds, you will watch the lesser good ending play out and you watch the credits as the game now unlocks the sound test. I'm guessing that the reason this happens is because the game needed to unlock the sound test before anything else, but why not have it at default like Advance 1? 
Or why not unlock it after the good ending as well? This had to have confused so many players back in the day. Like seriously, I find this to be really asinine. But since the sound test was unlocked, we can finally talk about the presentation. And what can I say? I've praised the looks of these games since the very first video, and this is by far the best looking one out of all. Such great looking backgrounds, foregrounds, detailed sprites that just capture the characters so well and animate so smoothly. The idle animations have been a Sonic trope since day one, but one thing I can't get enough of is the way certain teams have different idols. Like when Sonic is partnered with Amy, he stops and takes a nap on the ground and she watches him sleep. I don't know, I just find that really entertaining. Similar to Sonic Battle, this game got the adventure cast back to do grunt, and like I said last time, I love this cast. And this was actually the very last time they ever did voice work for a Sonic game, which is unfortunate seeing as Dean Bristow, Eggman had passed away after the release of this game and before Shadow the Hedgehog, the very next game. You're going to pay for that! But lastly, the soundtrack. Where do I begin? Every piece fits the scenery quite well from the bustling cities of Route 99 to the mechanical factory of Ocean Base. The soundtrack just packs a lot of atmosphere with my favorite mix of Green Hill to date. To the festive toy kingdom. By far my favorite zone theme would have to be Twinkle Snow, since like all the others it captures the atmosphere well, and in addition to that it just has a relaxing feel good vibe. Each hub has a theme as well, and they also feel very relaxing with the slower version of the zone theme. I don't think there are many pieces I don't care for, and that's saying something in comparison to the last three games, since I think this time they finally knew how to produce music on the GBA that wasn't just okay or good, it was great. Anyway, now let's finally move on to completion. Buckle up guys, this might be a while. Sonic Advance 3 has often been considered to be the prime example of how bad getting into special stages in the Advance series is. I think that's a load of bull since if you don't enjoy completion in Sonic Advance 3, and hell, never have since the first Sonic game, that's fine. But whenever I go back to this game, I always start a new file and 100% it every time. So how does this go down? Well in each zone there's 10 Chao, and sometimes it'll be 3 in all 3 acts and 1 in the hub world like Route 99, or sometimes like Ocean Base it'll be 8 across Act 1 and 2, and then 2 Chao in Act 3. So I carefully calculated all 70 Chao, and I wanted to find out just how many of them were obscure by ranking them each from 1 to 3, with 1 being plain sight, 2 being wait. I think I'm losing my style. Anyway, I don't know what to tell you guys honestly, and when I say that I don't mean you're wrong for not liking it, I'm just saying that I find exploring these levels and finding the combos for the job of rescuing all the Chao to be fun in and of itself. I found looking for the special rings in Sonic 3K to be fun, so there's no reason why I shouldn't here. And I'll be honest by saying that I find enjoying completing Sonic 2 and not Sonic Advance 3 to be frankly hypocritical. Yes, you don't have to find every checkpoint in Sonic 2, but the fact is that if we all love 2D Sonic the exploration, then this should be what we all wanted. 
in comparison to Advance 2, while the screen resolution is an issue a widescreen game wouldn't have, this game does everything in its power to make sure you're set up for success in this hunt. For example, say there are four Chow on a stage. The moment you rescue one Chow, that data is instantly saved onto the cartridge and it will never have to be collected again. Thank God! This creates room for error, and since the partner system exists, no character is bone in exploration that would be simple as another character like in Advance 1 and especially 2. So get as many game overs as you want, which shouldn't happen because of the minigame system. And with that, you have one effective system for 100%. But what if you don't know where to look? Well, the Sonic Factory has got you covered. Here you can switch characters, go to the different zones, and most importantly, the closest thing the game has to a Chow Garden. Here you'll see all the Chow you've saved by pressing select as a checklist of Chow for each individual act, and so you know the general area for which you should be checking to find these guys. Is this the best it could have been? I mean, no, I don't think so. However, I still find this to be one of my favorite games to 100% because of how much I enjoy the journey there. But we're not done yet because once you collect all 10 Chow, then a key will appear in a random location in any of the stages from that zone. These are impossible to miss since they'll always spawn in plain sight, so finding them shouldn't be a problem. But this still was too much. While this does mean that I get to perfect my gold star run, since you have to beat the stage with the key, it's just too much, since if you fail the special stage, then prepare to go to get another key, which is just not fun. How about after 10 Chow, the garden will give you the key, and from there you can infinitely retry the special stages. Do I dislike it the way it is? No, but it's what I can't really defend. However, what I can say, at least you only lose the key upon death. A game that came out around the same time was Sonic Heroes, where just getting hit at all is what it takes to lose the damn key to those special stages and you fight a lot in that game, so that's a huge possibility. Even then, when dying, the key usually appears a couple steps away from the checkpoint every time, so I don't have too much of a problem with it of itself, but again, it's just too much. But with that said, how are the special stages themselves? Well, actually, they're pretty fun. They're decently challenging unlike the last two games, and I feel like I can see what's coming ahead on like Advanced 1, which was just a travesty. These stages make you collect rings. Some rings are worth more, some might be inside enemies, and there are these dash pads that increase your speed, but you get double the rings in this period. The skill curve here is very well done, since the ones for Route 99 and Sunset Hill are really easy to pick up and play, but for Cyber Track and Chaos Angel, you have to bring your A game. Now that that's all said and done, we have all seven Chaos Emeralds and can make our way back to Alter Emerald. And can I just say that one of the biggest flaws of the last two games has been fixed? Get this, you only have to play this game one time to see the final boss. Thank the stars. Three games in, we now have something Sonic 3 realized in 1994. Seriously, this game doesn't pad out the runtime by shoving the same game down your throat four times. This game is longer than one playthrough of Advance 1 and 2, sure. But the thing is that for 100%, you'd have to play those games four times, and as a result, they decided to make this game a little longer with one playthrough, and I appreciate that quite a bit. Since I'd take one longer campaign as opposed to doing the same short one four times. This game banks on its own replay value with the partner system and the rankings as opposed to making you play it over and over and over again and calling that replay value, which is good design in my book. So anyway, Gemroll takes the seven Chaos Emeralds and goes berserk like he did in Sonic Battle, and so Sonic must transform into Super Sonic and team up with Dr. Eggman to defeat Gemroll, now called Non-Aggression, which I guess is a play on words since he has nine sides and is aggressive. Oh, whatever. Anyway, one nice touch being how the final boss theme is the Gizoid theme from Sonic Battle. But for the design itself, meh. It's an okay boss. You charge, the tag action, the longer you do that for, the longer you have an opening to attack, rinse and repeat, and that's the game. I wish I could say more, but that's really about it, seeing as Gemrol's attacks aren't very powerful as an opposition to the unstoppable Dr. Eggman, and Super Sonic, I guess. But with that said, Sonic Advance 3 is now complete. Sonic wakes up, Master Emerald is restored, Angel Island is recovered, and the world is going back to normal. And so Sonic, Tails, Amy, and Kree make their exit with Knuckles bidding them a farewell. Following that, Sonic and friends go home as we see them travel through the levels in reverse order, cut up with shots of Gemrol still being alive, which leads to Tails and Cream working to rebuild him to the good guy Gemrol once was. It's a heartwarming ending in my opinion, with the accompanying piece fitting the mood quite well. But 
anyway, that's the end of Sonic Advance 3, and I don't know what to say that I haven't already said. I love this game, and as of the time of writing in early August 2017, this is easily my favorite Sonic game ever made, with levels I could play any day of the week, 100% completion that's extremely satisfying, replay value that's through the roof, and Sonic Advance 3 is a game I could replay on a second's notice. I know I grew up with this game, but when I rebought it in 2012, I didn't think much of it, thinking that it was pretty good, but not much more. I'd always taken people's word for it that the 100% sucked, and so I never tried it myself. That was until 2014, when I tried 100% for all of these games, and that's when my love of this game had sunken in. As the finale of Sonic's career in the GBA, I couldn't have asked for anything better. This game is really an interesting point in Sonic's history as well. I already said this is the last time we'll be hearing the classic cast, but at the same time, this was the final Sonic game before the series basically imploded upon itself. In 2004, Sonic Advance 3 was viewed as another quality Sonic game, and in 2017, it's fascinating to look back and see how after this game, we got consistent years of mediocre games, alright games, and downright terrible games that are some of the worst games of all time. All this making the credits theme even better. But anyway, another thing that makes this an interesting game historically is that this was the last time we ever had a playable 2D Tails, a 2D Knuckles, a 2D Amy, and a 2D Cream. Never again would this be done in a future 2D outings because of games like Sonic 06. Going forward in games like Sonic Rush, while you had Blaze, you'd miss climbing walls as Knuckles or breaking bosses as Cream. Doing this marathon has made me realize that I miss these characters. I want to see them come back and do things again. There's a lot of potential that they are just plainly missing out on nowadays. I remember in 2012 when Clement did his playthrough of this game and he said that Sonic 4 Episode 2 would finally bring back 2D Tails, and at the time everyone thought that it had potential to see the return of other 2D characters. Of course, the final product just allowed Tails for 2 player, which sucked, and so in 2017, we now have Sonic Mania, and these characters are finally brought back and being given the respect they deserve. With that said, that covers it for the Sonic Advance series. I'm happy to have done this marathon to relive some childhood memories, as well as lighten the spark of my interest in Sonic, which honestly, had been diminishing greatly in recent years. And now I cannot wait to play Sonic Mania to get more of my 2D Sonic fix. I've got nothing more to add really, so thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.